This is The Energy Show with REI Energy. Energize your investments and maximize your tax deductions. Here's Mike Maselli. My name is Mike Maselli, and this is The Energy Show with REI Energy, where we're energizing your investments and maximizing your tax deductions. Today, we're going to be discussing investing strategies in energy, and you're going to discover the advantages and disadvantages of investing in energy and find out what type of investor benefits most from investing in this sector. Today, I'm talking to a good friend, John McGregor. John is the author of the 10 Top Reasons the Rich Go Broke. It's great to have you on the show today, John. Thanks so much, Mike. It's uh, it's really an honor. Love the work you do. And it's been so great uh, getting to know you over the years. So thank you for the opportunity. Got a lot to all, share today. For all of our listeners, John and I have been on the Rich Dad uh, show as well. And uh, we had a great discussion. And uh, I wanted to have John on today, primarily because John is a stock guy. John has been involved in the you know, in the stock market for most of his career. And uh, I think he'll give us a lot of insight uh, as far as these energy policies, one of the things I wanted to kind of start out and cover a little bit, John, if you can kind of give our listeners a background on, on yourself. Yeah, sure. Grew up in Hawaii. That's where I was born, almost born and raised. That's how I know Robert, um, both from Hawaii and played on the same rugby team. But started my career um, as a financial advisor, grew a very successful financial planning practice, then went on to corporate where I was a national sales director for a major firm on Wall Street. I was a national retirement director. I was a pension consultant. So I pretty much circled the globe in the financial world, spent a lot of time coaching other financial advisors. So I've, like I said, I've, I've pretty much seen every aspect of this business, the uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and then about, it was about 12 years ago that Robert approached me and I was sharing with him what's going on in the real world at a ground level, how so many people are struggling financially and not taking care of themselves. And that's when he brought me into the Rich Dad organization and, and suggested I write a book, which I which I did. Um, and that's led me to, to what I'm doing now. So I've left the corporate world altogether, sold my practice, walked away to really pursue what I think is the real solution that people need. And it's not really what most people think. It's a completely different paradigm uh, shift from what every other financial planner, the Susie Ormans or the Dave Ramseys tell you to do. And it really gets to the heart of why people struggle financially. And then we show them a way to get out of their own way. And so that's, that's what I've been on a mission on. Um, so it's, it's the book's been an international bestseller. Um, oh, by the way, it's called the, uh, the top 10 reasons the rich go broke and uh, just a little commercial for it. And it's, it's just powerful stories of people I knew that had everything and then lost it all. And so um, to make a long winded answer to your question, Mike, um, the, the, the book is the overarching theme is learning from people's successes is smart but learning from their mistakes is genius. So although this book is about wealthy people who lost it all, the book is really about why most people struggle financially. Um, since then, uh, you know, I've, I've been blessed to be able to tour around the world with Robert and, and some of his other advisors speaking at these big conferences. And um, I, I do coach people on uh, cash flow generation using the stock market, which we can talk about. And then now I've recently launched a podcast called Full Disclosure. So that's sort of my long-winded answer to your question. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on the show today. And uh, I think it's at a very important time where, you know, there's been this war on energy ever since the last administration, ever since Biden became president. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first thing he did, obviously, when he became president, was shut down the Keystone Pipeline and... Uh, and one of the things I kind of wanted to dive in with you was, uh, uh, you know, this ESG, which is environmental social governance. And that seems mm -hmm. to be what a lot of pension funds now are pushing because I guess the administration wants, you know, uh, investors to invest in these green energy projects, which I think now it's coming out that a lot of the a lot of this big green energy push is non-economical. And I think it comes down to the point where you have to follow the money, you know, to see where these corporations are making all this money. But again, a lot of investors, you know, they're forced in if they've got a pension or they've got an IRA, they're being forced into these investments that, you know, are not profitable. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. I mean, recently we just saw an electric vehicle company go bankrupt that Biden was in full support of. 
Um, you know, it's the old adage, go, go woke, go broke. And it's this massive push for environmental social governments, these companies that are basically embracing this notion that they now have to be environmental um, uh, supporters. And uh, so basically these investors, these pension funds, these investment companies are sacrificing performance over ESG. And it's an absolute, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous and um, and we're seeing a result of that, and and we're seeing a lot of companies um, not perform well, and yet these are the these are the companies that pension plans are being are, are investing in, and so people, the individual uh, investor, whether you have a pension plan or a four hundred one k or any kind of retirement plan, you're seeing performance uh, drop as a result of this push. And there's a bigger agenda behind this, in my opinion, that we can get to, but yeah, this is a big big issue for everybody. Yeah, and you have a lot of the, uh, not only the the pension funds, but you have a lot of the large funds like BlackRock and some of the others that, uh, you know, are all in on this green agenda. In fact, you know, Ford has now come out with their electric truck, and I think I read something last week that, you know, it takes close to eight hours to charge the battery on these electric vehicles. I mean, you know, and, and so people are now finding that out. And of course, the government continues to push this and you really don't read about it in the media. I mean, all you hear in the media is just glowing, you know, praise for these type of electric vehicles. And and I think, you know, it's finally starting to, you know, come down upon them. A hundred percent. Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, who I think is one of the most evil people on this planet, he was on stage telling people that this ESG momentum or push is designed to change people's behaviors. This is an investment fund, a money manager who thinks it's his role to change our behaviors and how we live. It's insane what's going on and how much power and ego and narcissism exists in the social elite structure. I mean, get this. I mean, I talked about this in my last show and you would think, I mean, and, and I'm just going to I'm just going to look at some of my notes here. They've now realized that given the excess weight, weight, excuse me, of electric vehicles, many parking garages can't handle these electric vehicles. There was a collapse of a five story parking garage in New York City with at least one person dead, which has really put a spotlight on these parking garages. For, for example, a Tesla Model S weighs a thousand pounds more than its equivalent Mercedes-Benz, a thousand pounds more. Now think of a parking garage full of electric vehicles, a, a, a 9,000 pound GMC Hummer electric vehicle is 2,400 pounds heavier than the similar sized gas powered Hummer, 9,000 pounds versus 6,600 pounds. That's a massive weight difference. And it, it, it's just amazing. And then you you mentioned the uh, the the F one hundred and fifty. The CEO of Ford took a cross country trip in the Ford F one hundred and fifty, and he finally acknowledged this doesn't work very well. I mean, he was <laughs> scrambling to find charging stations, and then, like you said, it took him eight hours to fill his fill his truck. And it's just leaving a lot of these electric car manufacturers scrambling to figure this out. In China, we're seeing a a, a plethora of electric vehicle makers go under. And I think we're going to start seeing the same thing here. I mean, I, I see it in my own neighborhood. There's a charger, there's a Tesla charging station here and, and we're a direct route from San Francisco to Lake Tahoe. So you got a lot of the wealthy elites, the socialist elites driving up to Lake Tahoe to their beach, to their beach homes. And there's, a, there's lines of Teslas waiting to be charged and they're sitting there for 40 minutes. <laughs> just charging, not let alone the two hours they're waiting to get their car in there. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And this whole thing is based on a climate hoax, in my opinion. And, you know, we, we'll talk about that. But yeah, anyway, no, I, I agree with you 100%. And yeah. uh, in fact, you know, not to mention the weight of these vehicles, the the amount of stress that it's putting on our road and our <clears throat> and our bridges you know, when you when you start to drive. So, you know, people push, you know, there's a lot of push every time a new administration comes in about spending money on road and bridges because our roads are just the worst that, you know, anywhere else in the in the world. <clears throat> but now you're going to put a, a bunch of overweighted vehicles on there just to destroy them even more. And I think a lot of people don't take that into account when they, you know, when they're when they're looking at these types of vehicles is that, 
you know, I mean, everybody's got great advertising, but just the, the, the vehicles themselves, you know, are just not ready uh, or the batteries are not ready. And not to mention inflation, right? I mean, inflation has been primarily caused by the price of energy because, you know, to build these electric cars, you know, most of the, the batteries are being built in China and they're using coal-fired fi coal power plants in order to to build these solar panels and to build these batteries, but then they're paying 20% more for their crude out of Russia because of, you know, the sheer price of oil has gone up close to 20%, which is, you know, great for our business. I mean, I have no problem with that. I mean, we don't, we don't, you know, our business, we, we do direct drilling and we, we enjoy higher prices, you know, but there's, there's a security issue in my opinion that, you know, the, the government uh, is obviously, you know, pushing this green agenda and making us less secure here in the United States just from the war that they've had on hydrocarbons. I, I, you're so dead on, Mike. I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, there's so much to unravel here. And when you talked about the Keystone Pipeline, that was the first thing he did once he came into uh, to office was to kill the XL Pipeline, which killed 13,000 jobs with a stroke of his pen. I mean, what... What is more environmentally friendly to transport oil? Is it a pipeline or is it a train or a diesel powered truck? And he killed the XL pipeline because of environmental issues. The pipeline's the, the, the cheapest, the safest, the most environmentally way to transport oil. And he killed it. Yeah. You know, this Bidenomics, this thing, this term we keep hearing out there, Bidenomics, and they're trying to gaslight this as some great glorious thing. And, Robert Reich, a former secretary of labor, who's been dead wrong for the last 40 years on every economic policy and prediction. He's out saying that the economy today is Goldilocks. He's never seen a better economy. The bottom line is that Bidenomics is really just a, it's just a ploy to destroy American energy. And speaking of batteries, we've already this year seen a hundred fires involving lithium batteries just in New York City and 66 <laughs> injuries and 30 and 13 deaths with electric batteries. And no one cares. No one cares. They're totally against mining oil and natural gas. Um, they're totally against that. But they don't mind a, a, a an eight-year-old um, out in the Congo mining for lithium, nickel, cobalt, and these other things. It's so hypocritical on so many fronts. I mean, natural gas is a game changer. Mike, you know this better than anybody. It's affordable, it's plentiful, it's domestically produced, right? It's reliable, it's environmentally friendly, and they don't want to have anything to do it. This is just a scam on so many fronts. I'm sorry. No, I agree with you. And, um, you know, it continues, they continue to push these agendas. And it was like you said, I mean, you really don't read about it. You may read about it in the paper on page 13 or 14 that there was a, you know, an electric car that caught on fire and burned but you don't read about it on the front page of any of these newspapers and uh, or the media outlets. I mean, you never rarely hear about it uh, because I believe that, you know, people are so afraid that they're going to be, you know, obviously uh, the, the, the negative stuff is going to be talked, you know, spoken about their companies or themselves. They're afraid to stand up and, and talk about this green agenda because it seems like that even the you know the uh, the firms like PETA and some of the you know the companies that once stood up for uh, the wells, for example, and stood up you know now they're building these offshore windmills that uh, basically are you know are, are destroying not only the, the 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 navigation of the wells but also of the military. But yet it doesn't seem to to, to stop these these you know, these offshore windmill farms to be built. Yeah. What happened to save the whales, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, every day we're seeing whales washed up on the shore on the East coast and it's directly related to these, these offshore wind farms and the administration knows it yet. They're out there denying it. I mean, suddenly they're building these offshore wind farms and then all of a sudden whales start washing up uh, out of the, uh, on shore and they're not related. I mean, come on. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. I mean, I was going to mention this earlier, $2,800 is how much energy costs have spiked for an average family per year, 
thanks to Bidenomics. And there's no end in sight. I mean, the average price of gas in the first 30 days of Donald Trump was $2.39. I mean, you probably know better than I do. It's $2.39 the first basically two years of Trump's administration. 30 months into Biden, it's $3.87 and rising. Mike, I'm, I, I would love your take on where you think oil is going. I think it's going higher. But um, yeah, and this is a direct response to policies that are being generated out of the White House. They want to crush the industry. They want to crush fossil fuels entirely. And it is, you know, the prices are going higher, not only uh, for gasoline, but for other products that are manufactured. I mean, a lot of people really don't realize there's, there's over 6,000 products that are made from fossil fuels. Yep. And so that obviously has been a big driver for inflation and uh, because it costs more money to to I mean, when you look at companies like Amazon or you look at some mm -hmm. of these companies that deliver a lot of their products, well, prices have gone up across the board because simply the cost of fuel, the cost of our food, the, the food that we grow. I mean, fertilizer is made from natural gas. You know, the cost to run tractors. I mean, you can't use electric tractors. I mean, you know, diesel is, you know, the most uh, the most common fuel used in, in, in heavy equipment. So unless we're just going to go back to the Stone Ages and we're not going to, to uh, you know, care about how our future is, where we're going to turn around and end up like Germany, where, you know, we're mm -hmm. having to go back to burn coal and we're having to burn, having to burn wool, wood in order to, to heat our homes. I mean, that seems down the path that a lot of these politicians are headed, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're we're going into the path of Germany. I mean, there is such a scarcity of firewood in Germany because people need it to stay warm. I mean, they can't afford they can't afford to uh, to run their heaters. It's it's scary. And and when you look at the people in charge, Mike, you know, people like Jared Bernstein, Biden's top economic advisor. This is his bio. This is his top economic advisor. Jared Bernstein's never had a job in his life, by the way been a politician or been in politics the entire his entire career he graduated with a bachelor's degree in music where he <laughs> studied the bass he earned a master's of social work as well as a doctorate in social well welfare from columbia university i mean these aren't serious people and a recent study done showed that 62 percent of his of his finance team people are involved in commerce 62 percent have no business experience whatsoever and then fast forward to Jennifer Granholm. I think that's how you spell her name. Yeah. She's the Secretary of Energy, right? Right. She was testifying in Congress. And one of the congressmen asked her, do you think we should, we should convert our military equipment like tanks and Jeeps to electric vehicles? And she said emphatically, absolutely. So could you imagine we're in war with Russia, right? And we're in our tanks and our Jeeps. And suddenly we ran out of power. And we're like, we raise the flag. We say, can we, excuse me, guys, do you mind if we have a timeout? Um, our batteries are out. Um, <laughs> can we just take the next eight hours so we can charge our tanks back up? Go to lunch. It's on us. And uh, and then we'll resume soon. That's how these people think. I mean, it's it's a clown show, Mike. I just I can't fathom this. <laughs> And, you know, they can they continue. I think I read last week where Jennifer Granholm, she sold her stock right before that <laughs> solar company went went bankrupt. I mean, you know, so they're they're all in it for the money. I mean, that's that's the reason why they're there. They know very little about how the world runs. And, you know, that was another topic I kind of wanted to discuss with you. I was listening to the debates last night. And, you know, of course, when they're talking about energy and the things that a lot of the, the, the politicians running in the GOP was, you know, we're, we're talking about, none of them seem to grasp that the way the Biden administration is trying to destroy the fossil fuel industry is by using, you know, departments like uh, that, the permitting departments. I mean, that's where a lot of your you know that the, they're really going after these these oil companies. I mean, just this week, you know, they're going to make it more difficult to get permits to drill offshore in the Gulf of mm -hmm. Mexico. You know, they've killed the permitting on BLM land, where which is government-owned land. Now, where we drill at, we're we're mainly on 
privately owned land, so they don't have a lot of control. But how do they go after the, the fossil fuel companies? They go after them through the permitting process of how you get permits to set pipelines or you, you build facilities. And one of the main reasons why we have high prices today is because there hasn't been a refinery built in this country for the last 47 years. Uh -huh. And what company is going to want to go out and spend the type of money that's going to go want to go to their shareholders and say, you know, we need to spend $10 billion to build a new refinery. I mean, it, that that's just not in the cards in, under this administration. Mike, didn't Biden say at his State of the Union, he slipped and said, we're going to need fossil fuel for at least 10 years or yeah. something to that effect. And everyone just exploded. Like why would anyone build a rig or a, or a, uh, a manufacturing, an oil manufacturing facility, if it's only going to be around for 10 years? I mean, yeah. if that's not a clear message, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, I, I saw a great quote and, and I think this is the bigger picture that, that uh, we may want to talk about is, um, this whole oil, the, the the whole ridding of the oil and industry and getting rid of fossil fuels is all about climate change, right? Right. And climate change is, and this is the quote, where the weather is always your fault and communism is always the answer. And I think that's <laughs> the bigger picture here, Mike, is this whole oil thing, get rid of fossil fuel and, um, you know, climate change, they're all interlinked to basically... Marxism or total control of our lives. I think that's the bigger picture. That's what I'm seeing personally. So well, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because you know I know you're from Hawaii and uh, of course with the fire that just happened and you know the first thing a lot of these politicians came out was it's the climate right. I mean we've got to we've got to stop using fossil fuels and 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 that's so far from the point. I mean from what what the cause was correct. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the, the one of the first things the governor came out and said was, "Oh yeah, this is climate change." Um, had nothing to do with their lack of uh, accountability or their lack of responsibility to clean the land, which they were warned about many years ago by experts that basically Lahaina was a powder keg if they didn't do anything. Sure enough, high winds kicked in, knocked over power lines, and that started the fire. And then so many other things happened. I mean, this story in Lahaina is so much bigger on so many fronts and it exposes so much about our government and our politicians and how a lack of leadership can literally destroy cities and kill people. And that was a clearly an example um, that was on display on Maui. And, and I'm sure your viewers have already seen Biden's response. He finally came out, <laughs> you know, five days later, he finally mentions the fires. Then he's on Tahoe at an $18 million, you know, estate on the water there. And he's finally pressured to do a flyby over Lahaina, basically comes in, listening to survivors talk. He falls asleep. Then he gets on stage and makes this ridiculous claim that he was in a fire that almost, you know, killed his cat and his Corvette, which was basically a 20 minute kitchen. I mean, he just he just lied through his teeth. Yeah. But there is so much blame to go around. And of course, it's all climate change. And, and you're going to see this whole climate, this whole climate hysteria ramp up like we've never seen before. Everything that happens in society, whether there's too much rain, too little rain, too much wind, too little wind, if there's a hurricane, if there's an earthquake, if you stub your toe, if you have a lower back pain, it's all going to be about climate change because oh. that's what they're pushing here. And there's a bigger agenda around this that we can talk about. Yeah, though I'd like to get into that and talk a little bit, but it's the same. It's the same story over and over. I mean, in in California, you know, they just had monsoon type rains from a from a hurricane that, you know, a hurricane hasn't hit California in the last, you know, I don't know if it's ever hit one in history, but they had all this rain dumped on it, and immediately people were jumping on it saying it was climate change. You know, they've had all these mudslides. I mean, it's climate change. They've had you know, fires in California, but it's just like you said, because the environmentalists won't allow them to clear, clear the underbrush. Yep, absolutely. Um, but here's a sad reality. Despite the failures of this, of this administration, despite the failures of Hawaiian electric and the FEMA um, uh, individual, the people on the ground with FEMA and the other Maui officials and the emergency medical people, 
Um, the sad reality is the people of Hawaii will continue to vote for this guy and others like him no matter yeah. what, just as long as there's a D after their name. And, um, you know, the cycle of, of stupidity will will continue. Um, I swear, <laughs> I've thought this. Biden could authorize the military to carpet bomb Honolulu and the people would still vote for him. And the media would praise that decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, and I saw this, I saw this quote the other day. Would you hire someone who hates animals to watch your dog? <laughs> of course not. Then why do you elect people? Why do you vote people who hate America? It makes no sense to me. And it's just so infuriating. And, you know, and where's Biden now since he did his five hour flyby in Lahaina? He's back in Lake Tahoe at his $18 million uh, resort estate on vacation till Saturday. These people don't give a damn about American citizens <laughs> at all. They could care less. After all, Maui never gave Hunter any money. So why why would the Biden cartel care about anything going on in Lahaina? Um, they're going to vote for him anyway. And by the way, as I get on this rant, as I often do, I apologize. Who do these oil policies hurt the most? The rich? No, the rich make money off this. It squeezes the middle and lower class the most. So you have to wonder, you have to sit back and go, are they purposely trying to destroy this country? I mean, everything they do seems so destructive. I mean, you have to wonder, is this all on purpose? Well, they're certainly trying to destroy the middle class because, yes. I mean, like, I mean, who can afford to buy a seventy to a hundred thousand dollar electric car? I mean, they claim that you know they're out to try to save the you know to they're the people that they're protecting, and I agree with you. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the population, you know, they don't. I mean, they don't really realize, or maybe they do realize, but they would rather have some small government subsidy as opposed to to having a successful, you know, a chance to be successful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, and it goes right down to the, to, to the people that vote for them, that continue mm -hmm. to vote them into these offices because they come out every time and they, and they talk about how great, you know, we're, what we're doing for the middle class and the lower class where they're the people that are being hurt the most, especially with high energy prices and especially with electric cars. And they're going to continue to be, because if you're in, if you're in the upper class, I mean, you know, spending $70,000 on a, on an electric vehicle, Hey, that's no problem. But when you're, you know, when you're trying to, you know, you're having to, to make a choice between, you know, feeding your family or driving to work, you know, I mean, those those are the people that that that, that they're killing with these policies. Hundred percent, and and they could care less. I mean, Robert talks about how he made a fortune when Biden uh, killed the XL pipeline, right? Yeah. You know that story, yeah. Mike. I mean, yeah, we were selling bro, oil for for you know roughly forty to fifty dollars a barrel, and then the day he comes out and kills the XL XL pipeline, you know, the price of oil shoots up to eighty eighty five dollars a barrel. And yeah. uh, so, you know, obviously for our business, it helps. But what it doesn't help for our business is that the, the uh, you know, just the the media and everything. I mean, they yeah. push these agendas to try the, to create the, you know, the oil companies as being bad for the country. And really it's, you know, it's it, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, we're out trying to you know, develop energy to, in order to, you know, make it cheap for uh, for people to get their Amazon packages delivered, to get their Walmart packages delivered. I mean, you know, so we're we're trying, we're out there every day working hard to try to create the the energy that this country needs. And for fossil fuels, it is going to continue to be the one number one energy source for the at least the next 20 to 30 years. At, at least, Mike, I mean, you know better than I would, but yeah, I mean, I, I, how, how can we, how is it possible that we could potentially live off wind turbines and solar? It's just, it's, it's impossible. Uh, well, it's already been tried. In, it's already been tried in Germany. I mean, obviously right. they, they spent billions of dollars on trying to make wind and solar, even the French. I mean, the French have gone back to nuclear power plants. I mean, if, if people were really serious 
And I have to commend the governor of Texas because we do have a new a new nuclear power plant that mm -hmm. is being installed now here in Texas. Uh, simply because you know, if 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 companies really truly want to go green and to reduce our carbon footprint, and I think a lot of people don't realize that you know we have about three hundred million people here in the United States, and our carbon footprint is half of what it was you know that over the last several years and that comes from direct work from the fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. in order to reduce that co2 emission for you know for our country but when you look at countries like china and you look at countries like india mm -hmm. i mean you know if, if, if there's no nothing being said about those countries yeah. i mean they they're calling them still developing nations so they don't have to enter into these climate accords yeah, yeah. India, China, the two biggest polluters in the world, and they're hands off. You can't mention them. Yeah. Academia won't talk about them. Hollywood won't talk about them. This administration won't talk about them. Nothing. It's mum on China and India. They get a complete pass, although they're the two biggest pollutants in the world. You know, going back to prices, and by the way, I think inflation is just going to get higher and higher, and so will, so will uh, gas prices. I was in the grocery store the other day, and I think I had a, a, one of those small baskets of stuff it was like $70, yeah. crazy. And it's not a crazy story, but they have these in the deli at my grocery store. They have these pre-made meatloafs. They look horrible. They look like a <laughs> cow pie, but they're delicious, all right? They're the best meatloaf ever. It's up, it, it, I was paying uh, $6.99 for one of these things, these cow patties. They're $10.99 now. $10.99. It's crazy what prices have done. Oh, yeah. And but it all directly the, affects affected yes. by energy you know what it costs 100 percent. To... that's exactly right and but here's that... the thing oh, I, I don't think they want a solution to this mike i really don't i think i mean look bill gates owns five private uh airplanes private jet five private jets who knows how, how many george soros owns john Kerry was just caught in a lie saying he's never owned a private jet in his life if this climate hysteria is, is an existential sh threat to our lives and the whole world is going to burst in five years, wouldn't they not fly private jets anymore? I mean, if they're really concerned about that, Biden takes Air Force One plus a, a, a bevy of, of SUVs behind him every single weekend he flies to Delaware. Think of the carbon footprint that is every single weekend back and forth to Delaware in a 747, just so he can sit on the beach and eat ice cream. And they tell me this is an existential threat and we have to do everything we possibly can to save the planet. It's such BS on steroids, I, I can't stand it. It's, it's unbelievable, but I don't think they really want a solution. I think if Elon Musk came out today and said, you know what, I've just figured out a way to convert sand into energy, they wouldn't want it. They don't want this to end. They want this to perpetuate forever. So they have this fear blanketed over our lives forever. They don't want us. So that's why they won't touch nuclear, nuclear, I mean, or hydrocarbons or any of these other alternatives. They want this grind on our back constantly so they can control our lives. This is the direct push for socialism or Marxism or communism, whatever you want to call it. This is a direct agenda to control our lives. They don't care a damn about the economy. They don't care about the climate warming, cooling. They don't care about climate change. This is all about controlling our lives in every aspect that we that we live. No, I agree uh, with you 100%. And uh, I hear you got a new book coming out, John. When is it going to be available and what's the name of it? Well, thanks, Mike. I've got two books coming out. Actually, it's the antithesis to my first one, Why the Rich Go Broke. The uh, second one's going to be why the broke get rich. Cause I hear so many people say, Hey John, that's a great book on how the rich go broke, but I'm not rich. Show me how to get rich. And so that's going to be my second book. It's the top 10 reasons the broke get rich. And then the, the third, the third book, which should come out simultaneously is um, the ABCs of picking stocks and creating a pension for life. It's all about this cash flow strategy that I teach. Well, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's been a great talk today, and I'd love to have you back in the future. Well, I'd love to welcome you on my show as well, Mike, and I really appreciate the top opportunity. Love, love what you're doing. And um, yeah, let's 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 keep up the good work. Thank you oh, so much. Thanks. It's been an honor. Thank you. You've been listening to The Energy Show with REI Energy. 
Energize your investments and maximize your tax deductions. To learn more, go to reienergy.com.